art market. This meeting is being recorded. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for accompanying us today in the first session of our webinars on the art market organized by UNESCO Barnard Montevideo with the National Heritage Commission. Thank you for coming. Before introducing our presenters, I'd like to give you some logistical tips about how we're working. Do we have simultaneous interpretation from English to Spanish, from Spanish to English? So please choose your channel in the button at the bottom. If you choose to hear in English or in Spanish, if you prefer to hear the interpreter when we're translating the presentations into English, or from English, then that's the English channel. Any questions you have, please send them by the chat. There's the chat below. We prefer chat instead of questions and answers. So for this event, we're transmitting on the UNESCO Montevideo YouTube. UNESCO slash Montevideo we're going to rece receive questions by YouTube as well. And after the meeting, we're going to upload the English version. So you can refer to it again and again. With these logistical housekeeping tips, it's an honor to be organizing this seminar cycle with the Heritage Commission on the 50th commit anniversary of the commission and in our agenda of events that we've organized worldwide. In these worldwide events, and because we think it's very important for our region, we would like to underscore the role of the people joining us to work with the ethical and moral obligations of our worldwide agenda. My name is Maria Frick from Uruguay in Argentina. I'd like to give the floor to our partners today. William Ray, the president, the, in representation of the Heritage Commission. Thank you. Eduard Agustin Abella, it's oh, William Ray. It's a great honor to be part of something that is alarming for Uruguay and for the American, the region of the Americas, this cycle of webinars on the art market also come, coincides with our 50th anniversary of the convention from 50 years ago. It's an important starting point to discuss policies that I understand in my country are somewhat behind. We need to bring them up to date. We need to update them in illicit trafficking, but also in a single 
system in trafficking. And so also the fundamental importance also it's very important for me to keep in mind there are other topics that are satellite issues such as the authenticity of our of our works this is very close to the authenticity and falsifying counterfeiting because we write in this in this system of illicit trafficking Thank you, Willie. I'm going to introduce our deluxe speakers. We have three one hour webinars. It's a busy time of year. And so we're working virtually. We have very high level encounters with very high level. We have Christos de Janitz, who's an associate professor from the Danish Institute. He's going to talk about reflections on the antiques market and certified antiques and counterfeits. Christos has great experience in this area in international networks of trafficking in antiques with the certification of antiques in auction galleries and private collections. He works with the uh, in misconceptions that are the fooling in the market of, he's an archaeologist, he's a judicial expert in the volume and tra uh, trafficking in cultural goods in the market of illicit antiques published in 2019. Then Alessandro Kecki will be with us. The, these questions will have room for questions, so please be ready. So thank you. You have the floor. Let me first unmute. Can you hear me now well? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Maria, and everyone who is uh, has invited us. I'm very honored to uh, present uh, uh, cases of illicit antiquities looted and smuggled and uh, some claimed and repatriated, but also fakes. These are recent cases um, that uh, appeared in the market. But also, in the end, I would like to, to make a connection with Latin, a Latin American country as an example of ongoing cooperation that can be easily be transferred as well to with actual practical examples to Uruguay. So starting from the basics, in 1970, one of the main articles of the UNESCO Convention was that um, from now on, whatever have happened, uh, happened, let's start and whichever object, whichever antiquity appears in the market should be accompanied by an appropriate certificate uh, of uh, export from a, by an export yeah. license um, that will prove that the object is legally out of its country of origin. 
However, the whole um, uh, UNESCO convention in practice was ignored by the market. And uh, uh, the problem is ongoing. Hence, we have, for example, this kind of uh, discussions today. Uh, if, if, if the problem was solved in the last half century that we are already through uh, after the convention, then uh, uh, we wouldn't have any discussions anymore. Um, it is indicative that even UNESCO itself in its latest announcement um, uh, have stated clearly that um, uh, in the last few decades, uh, the, uh, the, the, the market have boomed in illicit antiquities, which indirectly, of course, is uh, an admission that the convention was ignored. Um, my research is uh, mainly based on, on one part, on confiscated photographic and document archives from dealers that uh, used to uh, uh, be the, in, in, at the top of the illicit antiquities and antiquities market hierarchy, and they were considered to be reputable. After they were raided, examples here of Giacomo Medici uh, down at the uh, uh, right corner, Gianfranco Bechina here, uh, Robert Hecht on the top left corner, and uh, Robin Symes and Christos Michailidis um, at the top right corner. Um, the most uh, valuable uh, discovery by the mainly Swiss, Italian, and Greek authorities were not the tens of thousands of uh, antiquities that collectively were discovered in their premises, but um, uh, they were the photographic archives that uh, more or less each one of them had and became the valuable basis uh, for further research and understanding um, uh, as much as possible um, and get a fraction of the true nature of the antiquities market in a global level, not just on classical antiquities, not just on Greek Roman antiquities, but antiquities from all over the world. Because, for example, especially the archive of Christos Michailidis and Robin Symes um, presents and contains antiquities from all ancient civilizations, all ancient cultures around the world. Hence, the internationality of the illicit market. So you can see that objects were um, uh, gathered in Switzerland, where they were uh, stored in warehouses, usually called free ports, that uh, were enjoining certain uh, uh, customs and, uh, freedom and so on. And then they were going throughout the world, examples only of identified illicit antiquities that they passed through Switzerland after they left their countries of origin, uh, were found in the United States, in Japan, in uh, uh, um, Australia, just to show the spread, the widespread of the internationality of the illicit antiquities uh, network. And um, just examples of the institutions that uh, they were found to acquire illicit antiquities are uh, the most famous museums all around the world. You can see the list including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Boston Museum of Iron Arts, the Getty Museum, but also university museums that were supposed to, be, to have higher ethical standards. And yet Princeton University Museum of Art is just one example of the many. Uh, auction uh, houses like Bonham's uh, and uh, Christie's and Sotheby's were found to handle illicit antiquities over the years, uh, but also private collections um, and uh, uh, um, dealers' galleries. Um, but we are not treasure, heart, treasure hunters. What we are actually doing, what I'm, I'm doing in my research is starting from the object itself, I am um, searching and finding and reconstructing the true collecting history of an object, how it was trafficked, who participated in each level, what was the role of each one, um, where the money came, where the money possibly go, and how these people are connected with each other case by case, creating a network in order to understand the wider image of the problem, to understand the problem itself, and therefore to know how to fight it effectively. That, in an even uh, um, a more general way, was published, for example, in a research that I've done with my brother um, at an edited volume in, uh, by Oxford University Press that you can see here, The Connected Past, back in 2016. 
And we even proved that um, with uh, the cases that to just 94 cases that we examined, we ended up with a, a much more complicated and therefore more um, interesting uh, uh, um, network uh, in general on the way that antiquities are being trafficked internationally than the one that we knew until 1995, until um, these raids against these notorious and convicted now dealers, most of them, um, uh, started with Giacomo Medici in 1995. So I'm going to show you three projects that I'm working, examples of three projects uh, that I'm working on illicit antiquities, uh, two of them, and uh, on, uh, on fakes, another one, um, as examples of how I approach the problem and how I produce uh, active actual results on this to fight actively the, the problem and not only in theory. So the first project is based on the photographic archives on the research that I showed you before, the, 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 the research on the photographs themselves that have been confiscated from these dealers. Uh, tens of thousands of photographs um, uh, referring to all uh, ancient civilizations, as I told you before, a, a considerable part of them at least. And here is just an example um, of, uh, of an auction house in Germany that last July offered um, this case, this uh, 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 vase, Greek vase, um, complete, nearly as it is uh, being shown here, restored, uh, although it was initially broken in pieces, as you see, is missing the upper part and covered with soil. Um, both uh, uh, images, though, come from the same confiscated archive of Giacomo Medici, now convicted as a trafficker, um, presenting the same object before and after restoration, after it is being presented in the market. And the interesting part is that um, I identified the same object 10 years ago in Bonhams in London. It was, with, it was sold regardless that Bonhams have been notified about the connection with Medici. And it is interesting that um, uh, uh, the independent newspaper in London published that the, the buyer never appeared to pay and acquire the actual piece that he won in the sale once he, was, he found the, the Medici connection. But the object reappeared 10 years later at Gordon and Moss Auction House in, in Munich. And uh, I notified the authorities uh, together identified with other objects as well from the other archives, and it was withdrawn. At the moment, I am not aware of their whereabouts. And it's an indicative case to show how this is ongoing, sometimes even if they have been identified before, and the proofs are being out there, uh, easily searchable in the, in the internet. And therefore, the market cannot claim that they do not have access to the archives, confiscated archives, and they cannot conduct due diligence and provenance research, because in this case, it disproves the market, since the, the evidence are out there and published information with a Medici connection 10 years ago. The second project of mine refers to um, the research on illicit antiquities and any kind of problematic antiquities without needing to work on a restricted material. So without working on the photographs, the confiscated photographs themselves. Instead, with this project, which I am now uh, creating a new method to approach it like that, I am creating the, the evidence themselves here at the Aarhus University Institute of Advanced Studies in Aarhus in Denmark. So an example to show you how I do this is this object, uh, 5th century BC Greek vase, that it was offered uh, by Christie's in London on April 15, 2015, as lot 93, with this provenance. As you can see, it's very general. It's an anonymous sale back in 1986 in the Nusen and the Dylan auction house. And formerly it was in a very, in a general terms, uh, stated Japanese private collection, anonymous again, and acquired privately again in an anonymous way in 1997. The object is not depicted in the confiscated archives, so there is no actual proof of illicit origin. However, because I proved that the private collection Japan was actually a Japanese trafficker, 
to, to whom uh, this same object was found in his premises in the in his Freeport where, warehouses in Switzerland back in 2008. Um, and the, uh, also proved that the consignors were convicted dealers, the, depicted here are Bhutan brothers, owners of the Phoenix Ancient Art Gallery with branches both in the uh, uh, United States and Switzerland. Um, uh, I disproved that the, uh, the, I disproved the collecting history, the provenance that Christie's gave without having an actual photographic proof of the illicit origin of this object. And that was enough when I published the case before the auction for Christie's to withdraw this object as well, um, making it the first ever antiquity that was withdrawn without an actual proof of illicit origin. And showing that this new method that I am developing, it actually works. It produces actual results without having the actual proofs that are still missing for this object. Together with this object, I identified in the same auction, of the same auction uh, house at Christie's, three more objects, this time uh, depicted in the Bekin archive. And they were well as well withdrawn with this fourth one. And this research, um, and this new method that is not relying on, on the actual photographic proofs, the evidence, um, uh, can produce also actual results regarding fakes. Another example is again back to the Gorni and Moss that we show in the first example of illicit material, is the, um, uh, 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 this figurine, bronze figurine, that appeared as 6th century BC Etruscan figurine, where actually it was discovered at the premises of Giacomo Medici back in 1995 raid in Switzerland. And the three Italian professors, the Mostri Sancri, as they have been published their names, um, they have been mentioned like that, um, exceptional professors, world experts in Etruscology and Roman sculpture from La Sapienza University, um, they judge that this is a fake and here is the proof of it. This is the actual document that they produced for the same figurine that is a fake. However, that object, because it was just that it was a fake, was returned to Medici together with other fakes and apparently uh, was made again each way into the antiquities market, regardless it has been uh, uh, um, judged as a fake. And it appeared at the Gordy and Moss auction house in Munich last July and this December. If you go now at the Gordian Moss Auction House website, you will see the latest catalog and lot, one, uh, lot uh, 79 now, lot 103 was in July, as you see, is still on sale. Although I have notified um, uh, uh, the German authorities and they notified Gordian Moss, the Italian authorities, um, uh, since July, so since six months. So it reappeared. It was withdrawn in July and now reappears again at sixth century, although it is a fake. So this method identifies also fakes without needing actual photographic proofs of confiscated archives by police authorities uh, presented, produced by the dealers, the, the illicit dealers themselves. Finally, a third project is what are we doing with the antiquities that are being repatriated? Are we just celebrating that they, uh, they came back and we are happy about it? Or are we, we have the chance to do further research into its illicit, their illicit origin? And this is what we are doing with uh, Dr. Vinny Noskrov, uh, associate professor here at the University of Aarhus and director of the Antiquities Museum of the University, based on antiquities that have been repatriated from Switzerland um, with the involvement being involved there again, Giacomo Medici and uh, Christos Michaelidis, as you see. Here there are two Etruscan sarcophagi that uh, I found in the Giacomo Medici confiscated archives, decapitated the heads, while here you can see them uh, complete after restoration uh, in the return to Italy. But we were interested in the examination of fragmented Apulian vases from South Italy. And um, uh, Dr. Vinny Noskov succeeded to be sent to uh, these uh, fragmented vases to uh, 
uh, here in Aarhus University and we started, with, um, you can see here how they were sent to us on their, or in their original packaging, in their original cardboard boxes with photographs attached, Polaroid photographs by the dealers themselves and as they were dealing themselves with these objects and so on, fragmented before restoration, before they were put together as whole vases. And we started working on the packaging, on the Polaroid photographs themselves, as you can see here, and also removing the tapes. And here is an example. When we removed the original tapes that uh, they were on the box, we found here, they say, you can see on the top, Mr. Guido's Port Frank, which is the nickname of Giacomo Medici in the art world back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And therefore, in that way, we proved that some of this material passed through the hands of Giacomo Medici. And therefore, we started uh, uh, recreating and reconstructing now the true trafficking way that these objects were sold inside the international market. And obviously, this method applies to every kind of object, every kind of antiquity from whichever country around the world um, uh, is, uh, is, is coming from. And an example is that um, I was honored to be uh, asked by the Chilean government yes, uh, last year, last uh, August, to come to Chile. And I traveled to Chile and um, I met and I had the cooperation and discussion with the Chilean uh, government representatives of the uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Culture there, and uh, uh, especially with the Under Secretary of uh, Culture and um, other stuff. And uh, we are uh, being asked to um, uh, uh, advise them for uh, um, updating their own patrimony law. And I made suggestions on how they will actually fight this problem in Chile with the new updated law, which uh, I think is still uh, ongoing uh, given the pandemic and other issues that they had in Chile. But um, since then, uh, this cooperation flourished and flourished in a more actual than theoretical way. For example, we have two cases, one uh, uh, that has been identified by the Chilean cultural authorities in a um, in, uh, US uh, auction house and gallery in New York. And I brought them together with the public prosecutor, with the right public prosecutor in New York. And this, going, uh, this case is going very well. And we hope that uh, very soon the vase, this is just an example, it's not the vase itself because the case is ongoing. I would like to give just an example of the case. And the vase will uh, hopefully come back very, very soon. The other case uh, appeared last October when uh, the police authorities in Chile's uh, national airport in Santiago stopped hundreds of Byzantine, Roman and Greek ancient coins uh, coming, of course, outside of Chile, because otherwise they couldn't have been excavated in Chile for obvious historical uh, archaeological reasons uh, without any complete provenance and justified legally. Um, I helped them identifying the kind of the, the coins um, the case is also ongoing. This is again an example as a photograph. It's not an actual photograph of the actual case. And hopefully this case will go very, very well uh, with the Chilean government and uh, get hold of the uh, pieces under examination. Um, I wanted to, to thank you all. This is, uh, I, I, I'm definitely on time. And uh, I want you to know that this is my email address and whoever has any questions or uh, extra questions after the ones, I will be very happy to reply to um, all of them. Um, it's very welcome to write to me for any reason and uh, help in any way to fight collectively this problem. I showed you how actually you can do it in three different ways internationally. So thank you very much. And I pass the floor to our Maria Frick again, to our organizer. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Christos, y gracias por tan excelente thank you, Christos. Thank you for such a great overview. So up to date on your work. Thank you so much. We'd like to tell you that we have people who are working in this area. We're happy to have them here from Uruguay from Argentina as well that are working on this. 
and I'm sure that they will be communicating with you to see what they can do together. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Alexandro Keki. Alexandro is a senior researcher and a member of the, UNE the UNESCO chair at the University of Geneva. He wrote the book, The Solving International Controversies about International Heritage and other publications and international journals about solving controversies, international immunities and resolutions. Now, Alessandro is going to talk about the fight against illicit trafficking with criminal law and in group regarding infractions with cultural goods. Alessandro, you have the floor. I'll share my presentation. Can you hear me right? So um, again, thank you, Maria. Thank you. I have to get rid of the audio, otherwise. How can I stop the audio? Alessandro, okay. if it was offended. Yeah. Alessandro, if you te on the floor sin elegir un canal, no escuchas al, al if interpreter. You set it to floor, then you don't hear the interpreter. Yeah, done. Now you hear me, right? And I can speak. Good. Thank you. So um, again. Uh, thank you, Maria. Thanks to um, UNESCO and the National uh, Commission of Uruguay for inviting me to this uh, webinario. I'm happy to celebrate with you the anniversary of the um, 1970 UNESCO uh, Convention. Uh, of, co of course, uh, I would love to be in Montevideo uh, with you, but uh, I have to do this from uh, Switzerland. So. Um, I was asked to a uh, little bit talk about the um, illicit trafficking from the international legal uh, uh, point of view. Uh, so what I'm going to do actually is to um, present uh, with um, uh, more details what uh, uh, the previous speaker uh, Christo said about the illicit trade. Uh, then I will look at this problem from the legal point of view. Uh, by presenting quickly, very quickly, um, um, some instruments that have been adopted at international level uh, to fight this uh, uh, problem. And then I will spend more time on the, um, the latest instrument that has been adopted in this field, the Convention of the Council of Europe on offenses relating to cultural uh, property. So, um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge that, of course, uh, there is a, uh, an illicit trafficking in cultural objects, but there is also a prosperous uh, licit trade, licit market uh, in traditional outlets, so in auction houses, in galleries, um, but also online. So there are many uh, sellers, many collectors, uh, many buyers that actually comply uh, with the law. Next to this licit trade, in parallel to this uh, licit market, there is, uh, unfortunately, um, an equally prosperous illicit uh, trade in cultural objects. And here I would just like to um, remind what are the principal offenses related to um, the illicit trade. Uh, we talk about theft from museums, collections, religious buildings, but also illicit excavation from archaeological uh, sites. Uh, we refer to the detachment of objects from sites, buildings, and monuments, and the illicit exportation of uh, these objects in violation of the uh, law, the legislation of the exporting country. These 
um, offenses are often um, associated with other uh, illicit conducts like uh, corruption, tax offenses, money laundering, falsification, and cybercrime offenses, uh, because as I said, many objects are in fact uh, sold online. And it is important also to emphasize that um, organi um, organized criminal groups are all <clears throat> often involved in, in the illicit trafficking. Of course, we don't have to uh, think al always about mafia-like structures. So um, um, these well-established uh, uh, hierarchical um, organizations, many times there are organizations that are really fluid with networks that change depending on the circumstances. And the main reason why, the main reason, there are others, why organized criminal groups are interested in the uh, illicit trading cultural objects is that, well, um, um, this is a conduct that needs organization. Uh, one individual cannot dig uh, an archaeological site and then organize an exportation and then organize alone the selling of these objects uh, abroad. Um, it's, um, that's uh, the main reason why there are organizations um, working uh, in this um, sector, let's say. Then, uh, like uh, the Christos that spoke before me, I uh, could provide uh, uh, many examples of objects that have been uh, stolen or illicitly excavated or um, illicitly exported. Uh, I just provide a list, a short list with some pictures. So you see on your left hand side uh, another picture of Giacomo Medici, uh, this time posing next to one of the objects that he managed to export out of Italy. On the right hand side you find uh, the picture of a, a cuneiform tablet uh, which was at the center, not exactly this tablet, but this kind of object that was at the center of a another uh, recently, recent uh, dispute or criminal case against Hobby Lobby in the United States. Uh, of course, there are other uh, cases involving objects stolen or illicitly exported that are open, still ongoing, like uh, on your left hand side, uh, uh, you have the picture of um, the um, Atleta Di Fano, or um, Victorious Youth, uh, now at the Getty Museum in Malibu. On the right, you have uh, instead um, um, uh, the statue, the statue of uh, uh, Zhang Gong Zushi uh, that was stolen from China and now uh, somewhere in the Netherlands. So many cases, all these cases point to three essential elements. Uh, I want, I would like to summarize uh, the phenomenon of illicit trade with these three points. Uh, I'm somehow connecting to what Christos <coughs> said before me. So the illicit trade is transnational by nature uh, because um, traffickers, criminals need to export, to sell, um, to sell objects abroad where it's uh, uh, more easy to make money, where it is more easy to hide uh, objects, where it's more, where it's easier to um, change uh, the provenance or obtain new provenance for objects. Then the second element is that, uh, as I tried to say before, um, the two markets, the licit and illicit trade run in parallel. So the, we, we have uh, uh, objects that um, uh, stolen objects that can be sold together with the same, uh, let's say, catalog of objects that instead are perfectly uh, legitimate. So that's the uh, uh, importance of the role of scientists, uh, experts like uh, um, Christos. Their point is that, unfortunately, um, there are conscious or unconscious um, relationship. Uh, collusion between professionals of the art market and criminals. Uh, so in many cases, 
uh, as I said before, the participants of the art market are, um, they want to abide by the law, they want to respect the law, but in some cases they are abused by criminals, they just uh, are used uh, by traffickers, and in some cases, we must admit, uh, art dealers, um, collectors, uh, well, they just don't care about uh, breaking the laws. They just want to um, obtain an object or make a deal. Uh, but again, I want to re-emphasize <laughs> this point. I believe that most of those participating in the art market do want to uh, respect the law. So here, we, I'm not here to blame anyone. Having said that, I would like to go really quickly uh, through the uh, international legal instruments that have been adopted uh, by UNESCO and other organizations to cope with the problem of the illicit um, trade. Uh, here, I'm sorry, I'm going to make a sort of a shopping list because there is no time to um, emphasize the, the, the main point features of uh, the many instruments that have been adopted. Uh, perhaps uh, I can just uh, point your attention to the number of state parties, a number that increases every year. So I mentioned in the convention of 1954 and its protocols uh, for the protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict, but also the convention, the second uh, that uh, we are celebrating today, this year, the convention from 1970, and then the Convention of UNIDROA, of course, adopted by UNIDROA, but uh, on, upon request of uh, UNESCO, the Convention of 1995. Then very important also for uh, the illicit trafficking, also the uh, Convention on the Underwater Culture Heritage of 2001. Uh, then I would like to emphasize the role of uh, the um, Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, uh, which is a text uh, which should be um, taken into consideration because, uh, of course, it doesn't mention cultural property in the text, but uh, the organs uh, overlooking the implementation of this uh, convention have pointed out many times that this convention applies could apply also to um, uh, the illicit trafficking, precisely in those situations where an organized group is um, working, um, is, uh, uh, let's say, organizing, uh, managing the trafficking uh, at the international level. And uh, the second point, the international guidelines, and the second point on the slide, uh, well, it points to the fact that um, the uh, UNODC, the, the only body overlooking the implementation of this convention, has produced um, guidelines to help states to revise, if necessary, national legislation in order to actually use the uh, UN uh, Convention of 2000. So this is an instrument that must be taken into account. And then uh, I would like to pass quickly through the instruments adopted by uh, the European Union, the latest in uh, 2019 on the introduction and import of cultural goods. And then the conventions uh, of the Council of Europe uh, from 1954 uh, to the one on uh, archaeological heritage of uh, 1969. And then the latest convention, uh, which is actually um, a sort of revision of another convention that was adopted in 1985. And I will focus uh, more on this in a few uh, moments. And then <clears throat> um, just a, a little uh, uh, a slide on a convention adopted in the American continent, uh, the convention from uh, uh, the San Salvador Convention from 1976 which, however, has not been um, ratified by um, Uruguay. So this is a, a sort of a quick, very quick uh, overview. Uh, I would like to summarize again by saying a few words 
These instruments aim to complement national laws. They focus on uh, cooperation between states. Uh, they call upon states to adopt uh, trade restrictions and uh, try to facilitate return of institution. However, they really don't, they don't um, give priority to uh, the criminalization of uh, um, offenses. That the exceptions are the uh, UNTCO, the UNTOC and the Nicosia Convention. And then also overall these instruments, they don't try to uh, regulate the activities of market operators. So what uh, is done within the national markets um, by um, dealers, auctioneers, etc. This is left to states. One exception is the Unidroit uh, Convention. Having said that, uh, I would like to now pass to the uh, latest uh, treaty of this um, uh, legal, uh, international legal uh, framework, legal regime. It is the Nicosia Convention uh, or the Convention on Offenses Related to Cultural Property, uh, which as you can see, uh, was produced by the Council of Europe very, very uh, quickly. The decision of the Committee of Ministers was taken in 2013. So in 2013, they decided that uh, these, uh, the convention from 1985, uh, the Delphi Convention, as I shown you before, uh, had to be rat um, revised, sorry. And the Committee on Offenses Related uh, to cultural property held meetings in between 2015 and 2017. So it was really a quick um, uh, process. I was involved. I was one of the uh, legal experts uh, that participated in the drafting of this uh, convention. A convention that was adopted, as you can see, uh, in May 2017. So why the revision uh, of uh, a convention, which uh, I didn't say that, the Delphi Convention from 1985 that never entered into force. So a convention that remained actually on paper. Uh, well, uh, a revision, first of all, because it became uh, clear in 2013 that the text itself was not easy. So we needed a new text, an, an easy text to be implemented at the national level. So in fact, the revision aimed to make it easier, if you want. Then in 2013, you remember, the news were full of uh, um, reports from the Middle East about the destruction of cultural heritage. So the Council of Europe wanted to take position uh, in the protection of cultural heritage. So the third point, we may also think that the Nicosia Convention was adopted because the Council of Europe also want to appear as a cultural heritage defender next to UNESCO, next to the European Union, next to the United Nations. Anyways, we have a new text, a new text that is very important um, covers all aspects and components of the illicit trafficking. So um, if you take the text, you find articles on theft, um, illicit excavation, um, the importation, the illicit exportation, but also um, articles on the acquisition of objects and the uh, placing of objects on the market. Then states are called upon to establish effective, uh, proportionate and dissuasive uh, sanctions. Uh, it contains uh, rules on seizure and confiscation and provides for preventive uh, measures. Now, uh, as I said, I participated in the uh, works uh, for the um, uh, preparation of this text, so I could share a lot about these, the content 
in the story of this convention, but I would like just to say a few things in the time left. Um, so, uh, regarding the first three points, theft, uh, unlawful excavation and removal, exportation, importation. Well, here in 2017 and a few years before, it was still evident that the world is divided into source countries and market countries, and they have problems understanding each other. Uh, so uh, actually in Strasbourg, there was this division. So what uh, you find, what you find in articles three, four, five, and six is a sort of compromise. And the compromise is actually based on the texts that existed already. So the UNESCO conventions, uh, the um, documents from uh, uh, the European Union. Uh, so there's no actually novelty, but what we have is that states are now compelled to modify uh, national legislation to ensure that all these authorities are covered. Okay. And then very important is the two measures, uh, uh, the two articles on acquisition and placing on the market. So there can be uh, the case where a buyer is actually uh, found guilty, can be found guilty if he doesn't prove that he was careful at the moment of, of the acquisition. So uh, buyers, professional buyers or any dilettante can be found guilty uh, in a trial if he's unable to prove that he tried to respect rules uh, on the um, uh, due diligence on the market. The same thing for Article 8, placing on the market. The person that sells objects on the market, uh, being a square for a, um, for a market, a physical market in any city of the world or on, on the internet or in a gallery, well, he has to also to observe due diligence rule in order to be aware of the provenance of the, the object and therefore uh, in order to put on the market something which is uh, clean. And of course, if we may, may, found, may, may be found guilty if he's unable to prove that he was careful in this respect when he uh, made the decision to put an object, an object on sale. To conclude um, about the Nicosia Convention, um, he, the, this text may become really very useful because it would be uh, the first uh, treaty with a focus on the prevention and criminalization of illicit activities. Because the other instruments, well, they do not, as I said before, they do not focus on this particular aspect. Um, the, uh, for instance, the 1970 UNESCO Convention, the UNIDROA Convention, but also the regulation of the European Union, well, they simply ask states to um, do something in this respect. They, nothing is said in the text. The, the Nicosia Convention instead really identifies what are the elements of the illicit trafficking and what are the behaviors that should be criminalized. Also the 1954 Convention for the um, uh, protection of uh, uh, trafficking in, in the event of armed conflict. Well, the second protocol contains uh, some rules very clear on the trafficking, uh, but it applies to a specific category of objects, those of great value and uh, objects of great value that have been taken, exported in this special context which is an armed conflict. So um, uh, this is, uh, uh, that's why the, Neo the Neocosia Convention uh, would be important. It applies to all, all objects in peacetime as well. And then as you can see from the second point, the, the, this convention is also open to non Council of Europe member states. In fact, one of the uh, first states to ratify was uh, Mexico. Uh, of course, uh, 
and this is my last uh, uh, slide. Of course, uh, the text is not perfect. There are a few problems, probably because it was produced in only two years. So perhaps uh, there was not enough uh, uh, reflection. Uh, but I think it's um, still a good product for all the reasons I mentioned before. So far has been ratified only by two uh, states, Cyprus and Mexico, other have signed. And I know uh, that many others are working on the ratification. I just know that uh, um, various problems, including especially the pandemic COVID-19 uh, blocked uh, the works towards the ratification. And we need uh, still a, a few states to ratify, as you can see from uh, Article 27 um, of the Convention. So my time is uh, over. This is uh, all I wanted to say. I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm also happy to take uh, questions uh, if you have. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Alessandro. Creo que Thank you, Alessandro. I think today we've been introducing very important topics. Thank you, Christos, again, for what you've opened about traceability. And thank you, Alessandro, for touching on this topic that's so important for the region and for Uruguay. And locally important. We have a few minutes. We have a more complicated agenda. We had planned an hour, but if we'd like to open out the option for questions, maybe there will be interesting questions from the people accompanying us. We'd like to invite everybody to turn on your camera and speak. So if anybody would like to, Willie, do you have a question, a reflection first? Can you hear me? Sure, I wanted to ask a question. Perhaps this is a legal issue for Alessandro. Which is the difference exactly between the kind of system? The Nicosia Convention. The, the difference between both. Okay, he's asking the difference between signing and ratification. She's uh, suggesting that she stay in Spanish. What's the difference between ratifying and signing the Nicosia Convention for yeah. this, the party countries, the member states? So if I understood well, the question is for me, and it's about the difference between signing and ratifying a convention, right? So the signature is uh, <clears throat> just a preliminary step uh, that can be taken by a state uh, in order to sort of manifest an interest in becoming in the future bound by a convention. Um, ratification is something else, something more, uh, in the sense that the state makes a formal step at the international level to uh, so, for instance, going to Strasbourg and uh, um, depositing a specific declaration, uh, this is at the international level. And then at the national level, uh, between the signature and the ratification, there should be a adaptation of national at the national level of the, for instance, the criminal code. So the states that have ratified Mexico and Cyprus they simply realize that the national law is absolutely compatible with the Nicosia Convention. Nothing must be done. The other states, like Italy, for instance, they have to be do they have to modify, I don't know exactly what particular article of the criminal code to avoid a clash, a conflict between the convention and national legislation. So if, if there are uh, also obligations in, from signature. So for instance, one state should be coherent and uh, um, in between signature and ratification should 
try to uh, comply with the future text. So he should not act uh, as if he was not interested in fighting um, uh, illicit trafficking. So it's, uh, it's called a sort of uh, behavior in good faith uh, in, uh, according to um, international law. So quickly, this is the difference between signature and ratification. That's why many states signed, but still haven't ratified. Hopefully this is sufficient to respond to your question. Me permito leer, Claudia, Claudia Cabuli is la primera pregunta que tengo. If I may, we have a question from Claudia. Would you like to ask it yourself? Please introduce yourself to the rest of the panelists. I'm Claudia Cobule. I'm the national director of cultural sites and goods in Argentina. I'm coordinating the fight against illicit traffic in cultural goods since this was created in 2003, 17 years ago. My question is for Dr. Keki is I'd like to know what is the penalization in the Com Nicosia Convention for the crimes that it mentions? What is the criminalization? Uh, for your question, uh, well, in, uh, I, uh, I would like uh, uh, to share the text, perhaps is not uh, pertinent here, but what we have what we have in the convention is simply a, an obligation for the states to um, modify the criminal code um, in order to um, cover certain hypotheses. But then it's, up to the, it's for the state to decide how many years of prison, for instance. But for sure, the convention only asks that certain hypotheses are covered. The, an international organization cannot replace uh, states um, in deciding the amount. So for instance, for, um, uh, that's very important, no? I said before, the distinction between source countries and market countries. For Article uh, 4, so illicit excavation, uh, the market countries, so Northern European countries, obtained an exception to the criminalization. So actually, they are allowed to only um, uh, punish somebody with administrative sanction in case they are found digging on the ground. In other countries, like in Greece, they will apply a criminal sanction for digging on the ground. But the actual sanction, how many years in prison, how much is the fine, the actual fine in euros, it is left to the national legislator. Thank you. Um, gracias, Alessandro. Tenemos dos preguntas más. Eh, Thank you, Alessandro. We have two more questions that people have written in. There's another one for Alessandro, the next one for Christos. I'll read them here in Spanish, and we have them in the chat. From Elena Sacone. Or oh, would you, Elena, would you like to introduce yourself and ask your own question? Maybe she doesn't hear us. Hola, Elena. buenos días. Eh, mi nombre es Elena Sacone, soy Elena miembro de la Comisión Sacone. Directiva de ARCOA, la Asociación de Arqueólogos de Uruguay, Arco, y he trabajado mucho en arqueología subacuática. Eh, me interesaba preguntarle al doctor Keki si like Uruguay se considera un Keki, source country, un, un país country. fuente, digamos. Are we a este, country? También si considera que la ratificación de la Convención de Arqueología Subacuática de UNESCO de 2001 haría, podría ser una diferencia 
en el tema del tráfico y cuál sería el instrumento más importante para aplicar para prevenir la, la, el tráfico de, de bienes culturales. Gracias. A uh, very interesting question uh, because uh, allows me to uh, elaborate a little bit further. Don't worry, Christos, I'm not taking too much time uh, with this answer. <laughs> so first of all, on the definition of uh, pa Paese Fuente uh, or not, well, that's uh, um, a distinction that is left to Uh, the country itself. I don't know much about uh, the culture of Uruguay. Uh, I, I would tend to say that Uruguay uh, is a source country, but you may <laughs> say the contrary. I don't know. Um, the distinction is not really strict because in, uh, I live in Switzerland. It's normally considered a market or transit country, but There is some culture here outside, <laughs> uh, so the distinction is not so strict. Um, so I left you all to decide whether Uruguay is a source uh, or market country or transit. Then concerning the, the other question, so, well, the um, um, uh, I would suggest that Uruguay Um, ratifies the underwater uh, convention. Um, I suppose that uh, there, there are some, there is some interest in regulating uh, the, um, 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 the protection of the heritage that is on the territorial waters or beyond. So Uruguay has a long coast as far as I know. So uh, I would say that uh, Uruguay should work towards the ratification of this text. And with this response, uh, I want to try to respond also to the last question. Um, what is the best instrument, the most important instrument to prevent the trafficking? In fact, uh, uh, there is no one only instrument. All together they work. Why? Because all the instruments together, they reduce the space for traffickers. That's why it's important to have ratifications because we have less states, so less space for traffickers, for thieves. Uh, so if Uruguay and all, all other Amer Latin American countries ratify um, uh, existing treaties, then uh, life will, be, will become really hard for those that thought like Medici of exporting cultural objects. So um, that's why we talk about this framework. These instruments work together to prevent the trafficking because they, they serve to reduce the space for um, those that want to make illicit deals like hiding objects or um, changing the provenance the, of the title of uh, objects. Thank you again. Thank you very much for your reply. Uh, bueno, tenemos una última pregunta eh, que se hace. We have one question, which is in the chat, but perhaps we can get the question. This is a question that Marcelo Sweet, Marcelo has. Yeah. Marcelo would like to ask his own question. We can close out with that so we don't run over time. Okay. Marcelo? Marcelo? Okay, Marcelo is asking Christos about making duplicates. I don't want to read the whole exchange because he went on and on. Everybody can read the question, but would you like to reflect on the topic of duplicates? Hola, buen día. Sí. Sí. Adelante, por favor, sí. Yes, please go ahead. 
Eh, Ciro Yanis es un artículo que escribió hace... Ciro Yanis, es un artículo que escribió hace años atrás. We're talking about the duplication of cultural goods by countries of origin to, among other things, you could reduce illicit trafficking and by selling the duplicates, we can pay for future archaeological excavation. So this is the question that I asked without going into further detail. That was my question about making duplicates. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I indeed wrote that article uh, years ago, as you said. I think it was 2015, if I remember sí. well. Um, the, um, uh, uh, what I'm arguing in the article, actually, is that uh, to, to sell duplicate antiquities, so antiquities that have been produced uh, by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions, one after the other, exactly the same, uh, for a relatively significant financial value for the market, um, that is actually not a solution. And uh, if uh, I, I read well on your question, both in the in both kind of chats that uh, it appeared, I replied to it um, some time ago in both chats as well in writing, but I'm happy to, to reply here that I still support the conclusion of my article, uh, not in a stubborn way, of course, uh, but uh, actually because duplicates cannot um, fight uh, by selling duplicates, even with the approval of the country of origin. Um, so antiquities that they are exactly the same and the, the country of origin has thousands of the same literally objects. Uh, in fact, in, in terms of typology, will not uh, 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 solve the problem of illicit trafficking. And um, I can give you many uh, uh, examples and arguments to prove that point, but I think that the best one has been given already by Dr. Neil Brody, who wrote that uh, actually, uh, since the market is interested in high value antiquities. Since um, looters are digging in order to discover treasures that will make them overnight uh, wealthy. Uh, because of the example of, let's say, uh, the Ephronius Sarpedon crater that was excavated illicitly in 1971, breaking significantly, significantly the UNESCO Convention of 1970. Um, therefore, the market is looking always to sell uh, antiquities of significant value. And therefore, to put duplicates in the market, even with the approval of the countries of origin themselves, uh, will not stop the, the looters digging illicitly to, disco to, to, to discover uh, really valuable objects. Um, that will produce a lot of money, will not stop the traffickers to smuggle them, to deal with them, to disguise their provenance, because they will produce more money than any kind of duplicate will ever give them. And they have to, 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 to sell millions of <laughs> duplicates to, 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 to get the price of, a, of one really significant uh, uh, antiquity of uh, uh, real value, of immense value and the profit that we get from it. The same uh, is about uh, auction houses and dealers galleries. If you see the, the, uh, the biggest galleries are dealing with exceptional objects, they are not dealing with duplicates. Uh, they, they, they try to have objects of significant value because they want to produce money. This is the core of their business. It's not about the beauty or the history of the objects if they wouldn't produce uh, money anymore. No one will dig in the night if there was someone to acquire it for a substantial amount of money. And this cannot be served by duplicates. So as I wrote already twice in both kinds of chats that they were provided, uh, uh, unfortunately, my, my, uh, the conclusion of my article back then is still, uh, it has been proved already long time ago and it's still being proved. 
um, there are countries, as you say, that uh, they, they give uh, approval uh, with their approval to sell duplicates. I think Israel is one of them, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember uh, correctly. Uh, but looting um, is ongoing. Uh, therefore, it's being proved that this is not a solution. However, thank you very much for your uh, question, because it gives me the chance, even orally, apart from writing, to, to clarify this. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the reply. Thank you. Christos, we have one last question, and I think with this we close. Claudia, you sent it to me. I think we have a last closing question that Claudia has sent for me to, to ask. Regarding the embargo of Greek coins in Chile, the provenance of archaeological material from source countries to take into account when found this sort of cultural goods in market countries. This could refer to the application of the pro provenance con uh, principle. Um, thank you for your question. I'm not quite sure if I understood uh, um, uh, the, the, the meaning of it. Um, I think it, it's, it's about uh, the provenance of objects once they are found from the country of origin to a market country. Um, um, it's all about provenance research. Exact. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and thank you the translator also that helped me. Um, so it's all about, the answer is about provenance research, uh, ethical standards, due diligence, um, things that can easily be solved because everyone knows from where they bought the object from. Of course, in some cases, uh, this information uh, uh, may have been lost over the years or over the, the decades or even the centuries. But uh, from my experience, um, it is extremely difficult to find uh, a seller in the market anywhere uh, around the globe that is open and honest to give you the full information about the origin of the objects they are selling. And uh, having that as a guide, and from my experience, um, I can assure you that the, in, in, a, in a, a wonderful idealized world, um, uh, we would have uh, the opportunity to, to be out of job, jobless, uh, because this would have been solved to have honest market members, but because we, we do not, unfortunately, and because um, in my research I prove that they break always the rules, not only of the suggested provenance and due diligence rules, but also their own association guidelines, the market guidelines, the same way that their clients, the museums are breaking the acquisition guidelines, uh, their own acquisition guidelines when they acquire illicit material um, uh, against these guidelines, or they do not react uh, according to these guidelines when they are found to have acquired in the past illicit material. One example that I had myself, uh, two examples that I had myself, for example, is with a Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York that they never even replied to my mails, and in the end they gave back the objects that I found, and uh, are just examples that prove that point. So it's all about honest declaration of, uh, of provenance once this provenance research and due diligence in provenance research has been truly exercised and it's not just in theory by the market members in their catalogs or the museums in their websites and the equal catalogs of their collections. I hope that this I understood well and I replied your question. I think so. Tomorrow we're going to go deeper into some of these topics that came up today. As you know, the intention of this webinar is to deal with debate topics. We're going to talk about classification with Marcelo from the Commission from Argentina and other people who are present here today from the University of Geneva about some bio diligence, due diligence kits developed 
under the responsible art market. And we've translated this into Spanish to spread around our country. So we'll see you tomorrow. We'll be expecting you tomorrow for these two talks. We'd like to thank you for being with us today. And thank you again for our panelists, for Christos and Alessandro, for our partners. Thank you, William Ray, and all of our participants. Willie, turn on your microphone. No, simplemente estaba agradeciendo. I was just thanking you, and of course, Alessandro and Christos for your magnificent presentations. So we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for being with us. Thank you all.